about four years ago, I was perusing my Facebook newsfeed, probably supposed to be working, and I stumbled across a sponsored post from a menswear brand, Bonobos. I had never heard of Bonobos. What I saw in front of me, however, was not a typical promotion for a brand trying to acquire customers. Rather than offer me something like 25% off my first purchase if I gave them my email address or something like that, this was a link to a blog post about three tie knots you should know how to tie. Now, I have no idea what Bonobos' targeting plan was for this campaign, and I certainly fit into their core demographic, but this particular ad resonated with me because just in the weeks prior, I had been thinking very frequently that I wanted to learn how to tie a new tie knot. I was tired of the four-in-hand knot I'd been using for years. So I learned about the Pratt knot. I learned about the half Windsor and the full Windsor, if I'm remembering correctly. I don't do anything with the Pratt or the full Windsor, but the half Windsor is my go-to tie knot ever since that day. After that, I did what any consumer would do. I researched the brand, validated the quality of the product, and kept them in my brain somewhere. About two weeks later, I was retargeted on Facebook with a sponsored post offering 25% off my first purchase if I gave them my email address. I promptly did that and have been a customer ever since. What I just described is a really small slice of content marketing at work. To this day, I believe, if Bonobos would have tried to first hook me with the 25% offer, it would have not worked. There's no lack of men's e-commerce clothing brands with similar offers, and they most certainly would have just contributed to all that noise. Instead, they chose to provide me with something of value that empowered and helped me. This immediately created a positive association with their brand, which I validated through my own research, and then they nurtured me to the finish line with the offer. The reason why what I just described works is this. Instead of interrupting the things people are interested in, create the things people are interested in. Think about it. All of your life, brands have been obsessed with interrupting you while you're doing something else, while you're consuming content. You watching TV? Not anymore. Here's some commercials. Really enjoying a run of songs on the radio? Well, now that's over because there's a two minute commercial break. Reading a compelling piece in your favorite magazine? What's that? It's a full page for perfume. Content marketing is built on the premise that brands become the content creators. Stop interrupting you and provide something of value to customers and potential customers. Doing this will nurture a far more productive relationship than constantly interrupting. That's what content marketing is built on. I'm gonna cover three areas. Building a content marketing strategy, creating and distributing content, and finally, highlight a couple of brands that are just killing it at this whole content marketing thing. First and foremost, let's establish what content marketing is, and the best way to do that is by talking about what it most certainly is not. Content marketing is not an email blast. In fact, I'd like to move away from that lexicon altogether. Why are you blasting these people? They're your customers, your leads. Email is arguably the most personal marketing channel there is. People have let you into their inbox and you have a chance to communicate with them on a one-to-one -one level. Content marketing, it's not a press release. A dry snippet of you talking about yourself that needs to meet editorial standards does not pass for content marketing. Chances are your customers care far less than you do and press releases don't offer the opportunity to tell a good story. Quarterly newsletters are not content marketing. Four touch points over the course of a year with an email list you probably haven't cleaned up in ages does not meet the consistency standards of content marketing. Posting pictures on Facebook is not content marketing. Everyone posts pictures and the random need for your company to do it without a plan does not make you a content marketer. Finally, writing a blog post does not qualify as content marketing. Without a purpose, a plan, a strategy, Writing a blog post whenever you feel like it is creating content for the sake of creating content. And this approach will not propel you toward any meaningful goal. So then, what exactly is content marketing? Content marketing is a systematic approach to continuously publish and distribute content. It's about empowering users by providing relevant, useful content for every stage of the customer journey. I'll be sure to touch more on the customer journey a bit later. By consistently providing this, you create relationships with customers, which creates trust. And as we all know, trust drives revenue because we buy from people we trust, brands we trust.
If you don't already believe the importance of getting started, I've pulled two important stats that represent content marketing's impact. But also, seriously, just Google content marketing stats or why content marketing is important, anything along those lines. You will discover a plethora of, you guessed it, content that supports the need to get started. 96% of B2B buyers want content with more input from industry thought leaders. I believe I read recently that around 70% of the B2B buying journey is online. So if 96% of B2B buyers want content with input from industry thought leaders that no doubt resides at your organizations, most content is consumed online and the majority of the B2B buying journey is done online, then content marketing is clearly critical. Website conversion rate is nearly six times higher for content marketing adopters than non-adopters. So what this tells us is ultimately, when someone is ready to buy or ready to convert in some manner, they are much more likely to do so if your brand, your organization has committed to content marketing. The place you begin content marketing is not exactly tangible, but rather a mindset your organization needs to adopt. Content marketing is a commitment, not a campaign. Because content marketing is a systematic, consistent approach to continuously publish and distribute content, it's important your entire company understands it's not tactics, it's not even campaigns, but a mindset that must be adopted. Once there's buy-in to that mindset, you can begin developing a content marketing strategy. Like any strategic initiative, this one begins with research. The research tactics here are not exclusive to content marketing, but are critical to creating the best strategy possible. All of the different research tactics are going to provide insight into your customers or your prospects customer journeys. This is an example of a basic foundational customer journey. As you can see, the largest areas are awareness and consideration. Yet I see so much marketing focused on the decision phase. Until an organization can tell me they have every customer out of all the possible customers, awareness and consideration matter. In fact, they matter the most. Operating from a mindset that everyone always wants to buy and is always thinking about your company is a recipe for failure. Even the staunchest brand loyalists have a ton of things going on in their brains throughout the course of a day that has nothing to do with your brand or your products. I mean, how many people have never heard of a company, come across buy now messaging, and just do it in a completely linear path? It really doesn't happen especially in that awareness phase. Once you understand a customer journey drives a lot of this research, you need to start your strategic initiative with stakeholder interviews. Remember to have perspective from many levels of your organization on a variety of topics. These different perspectives provide valuable insight into every facet of your company. Next, it's time to take a look at the content itself. A content assessment is a quantitative and qualitative look at your existing content. Here's a hint you always have more content than you think. Once you have an inventory of all this content, you need to realistically assess if it's any good. Here's a hint, it's not as good as you probably thought. Once you have a true understanding of your starting point with content from these two perspectives, you can move into research tactics that begin to inform your new and ongoing content creation. Search engines are one of, if not the primary driver of everyone's heuristic content discovery. Heck, search started because of content. It needed to be organized and findable on the great big World Wide Web. Keyword research allows you to gauge what all these content explorers are looking for or hoping to find and tie it back to your organization or your industry. Media intelligence allows you to hone in and discover what people say and what they write about. This is a slightly different but equally valuable peek into people's minds and the insight you gain is essential. These monitoring platforms work as a keyword-based aggregation tool capable of pulling in social conversation, reviews about your business, and editorial content based on the searches you build. At Liquid, we like to turn a lot of our focus with competitive analysis to gaps. Imitation is not always wrong, but when it comes to content marketing, the gaps you find through analyzing your competitors does a great job of presenting opportunities for content creation. Assess your competitors' content, find out what they're missing through media intelligence, and fill the gaps that they've left there. As I'm sure you've figured out already, we're talking about content marketing through digital means. Not to say it doesn't happen offline, it sure does, but the bulk of content we consume happens digitally. Because of this, 
And because of the sheer number of tasks necessary to be a successful content marketer, technology plays a pivotal role that's twofold. One aspect is marketing automation. While commonly connected to email, it simply means any marketing task that can be automated. Take social media, for example. If you post four times a week to three different social channels, I don't think you want your Saturday afternoons interrupted to post to social. Marketing automation technology, like social media scheduling software, allows you to build out your posts based on an editorial calendar and automate those tasks. I'll get more in depth with editorial calendars a bit later. The second aspect of marketing technology is analytics. Your data is just your customers and your prospects telling you valuable things. How your analytics platforms are connected to your marketing automation, your CRM, and maybe even your ERP are critical to informing your content marketing strategy and informing how you adjust that strategy once you're done implementing. If you take a look at this slide, it should overwhelm you. It overwhelms me, and I'm pretty sure it's two years old. There's probably been hundreds of startups who have built a hundred more platforms that do the same thing, but definitely add to the confusion. This is the final reason the assessment of your marketing technology stack is so important. When you make these decisions, the platforms you select and implement need to support your specific goals and your budget. You may not need the dense feature set of certain platforms in some of these areas because your content marketing isn't mature enough to take advantage of them, or you simply don't require the capability. On the flip side, if you undervalue on this front, you'll be left with a lack of insight and a lack of efficiency when you need it most. Lastly, utilizing all the data you've gathered and assessed during research needs to go toward developing personas that tie back to customer journeys. The Content Marketing Institute calls personas the single version of truth for everyone creating content in your organization. That's a really important statement. The difference between personas and standard demographic profiles is critical. Personas aren't just demographic data points. They're meant to feel like human beings with stories and behaviors that support that. Content is meant to connect with humans, and this helps the content team. The other aspect of personas is tying them back to that customer journey. The journey I discussed before is at its most basic form. Through customer journey mapping with your personas, utilizing all that awesome customer data you just looked at, you can map each persona's unique customer journey with all the steps at each stage. This provides insight into the content that works best for them and when it works best for them. The in-depth research performed now has you ready to take all that data and build your content marketing strategy. But please, document your content marketing strategy. Fundamentally, writing down goals is a good idea. I think we can all agree on that. There's something to achieving what is written down versus what remains in your head. A common excuse I hear about not documenting a content marketing strategy or really committing to content marketing is a general lack of time. Not having enough time is not an excuse here. None of us have enough time, but we prioritize the things we need to do based on their importance. If content marketing can make you a better marketer and increase profit by cutting cost or increase profit through more revenue, which you validated through research, then it's important and you have enough time for it. The lack of a documented content marketing strategy leads to the random email blast, the random blog post, and the general lack of attention to the most important part of your marketing, content marketing. So what exactly goes into a content marketing strategy? First and foremost, document your business case for it. This is especially important if it's a new initiative or there was a seismic shift in mindset that was necessary to even begin this process. Is it going to drive revenue or cut costs? Next, you need to document goals that are specifically tied back to content marketing activity. This gets a little more granular than the business case. For example, this effort will acquire X amount of new customers this year. This effort will increase profit in this area of the business because of Y, or existing clients will grow Z amount this year because of the effort. The audience personas that I covered before live in this document to ensure everyone is on the same page. And finally, have a foundational channel plan in this strategy. What I mean by that is what are the main places you will publish and distribute content on a consistent basis? There may be more or less channels depending on certain pieces of content you create, but what are the fundamental channels you know will always be involved or you will take advantage of? Let's talk a little bit about content types. 
I read recently there are about 40 different content types. But what I want to do is focus on four main types of content we tend to create a lot of here at Liquid. As a medium, video drives content marketing. There's very basic psychological reasons video is so effective with human beings, and we covered that back in our Q4 Lunch and Learn last year. Video is effective, it's engaging, and everyone wants more of it. Blog posts represent the most consistent churn of content you can have. It doesn't require nearly the same amount of budget or time investment videos, infographics, or animations can, and it serves as the quickest way to get a variety of content topics out to the public. If you're doing content marketing the right way, chances are you're going to be writing a lot of blog posts. I read earlier today, demand for infographics has increased 800% in the last year, and they're shared three times more than any other content on social media. Those are astonishing statistics that highlight the importance of this visual content type better than I ever could. Infographics are great at telling stories and presenting big concepts or statistics in a really engaging manner. When video and infographics fell in love, they produced animations. Combining the visually appealing foundation of infographics with the motion video can provide as a medium, animations tell incredible stories and are very good at taking complicated information and explaining it in an easy to understand manner. Now that you have a fundamental understanding of four highly utilized content types, we have all the elements that go into an editorial calendar. The editorial calendar is the playbook for your content team. It represents everything that needs to be followed to publish content from both a workflow and strategic perspective. There's typically at least five elements in an editorial calendar. First, you need to assign an author. Who is creating this content? Let's make sure they know they're responsible for it. Is it one person writing a blog post or a whole video team on a two-day shoot? Second, what is the topic of this content? What is the author creating the content about? Third, what type of content is it? Knowing this informs the length of time necessary for its creation and how end users are going to engage with it. Fourth, what persona is this mapped to and where does it fall in their customer journey? This information directly informs the nuances and details the authors need to create an effective piece of content around the selected topic. And finally, where is this being published and distributed? A digital publication? A company blog? What social channels will this live on? When operating with all this information, the content team is always organized, always on brand, and always on strategy. With all this organization, documentation, and workflow in place, who exactly is this team that's creating and distributing, making sure all the content is effective? We like to break it down into four separate buckets. Strategy serves as the oversight. They are capable of speaking the language of every pillar in the content team and are constantly making sure the content created is on brand, serves the strategy, and the distribution channels are reaching the right people. Production is the creative arm of the content team. They make sure all this hard work wasn't for naught by creating content and presenting that content in a way that will emotionally resonate with the intended personas. Without this, all you have is a pretty strategy and a media plan to deliver a bunch of meh. The marketing arm of the team is responsible for making sure the content gets into the hands of the right people at the right time through tactical expertise and the ability to coordinate closely with your analytics team. Content operations is your marketing technology team. They ensure the marketing automation, the CRM, and any other tech supporting operations runs smoothly and is supporting the strategy. The analytics personnel provide in-depth data analysis to optimize current content distribution and iterate on the established strategy. If you never evolve based on what data is saying to you, you will grow far less effective as a content marketer over time. While distribution of content only represents one part of successful content marketing, I'd argue it's the largest, most important aspect. Fundamentally, content distribution falls into three core areas, all of them critical to your success. Owned content is what we've been discussing up to this point. Owned content means the content you create, publish, and distributed on the channels you own and control the ecosystem. This is your company blog, a digital publication, and all of your social channels where you wanna post that content organically. Earned content, or traditionally referred to as earned media, is at its most simple form, content you are not creating. Earned content historically is news coverage created through PR efforts or 
just being newsworthy. Reviews, unless covered by editorial means I just discussed, and sharing were historically word-of-mouth advertising shared between people on a very one-to-one -one level. The internet, and social media in particular, morphed and amplified reviewing and shareability into incredibly powerful forms of earned content. I have spent the entire time singing the praises of content marketing, but the one negative aspect to all this content being created by all these brands, big to small, is just that. There's a lot of content. It's everywhere. We're inundated with it throughout our days. There's also a lot of bad content because of this. The idea behind paid content distribution is to identify essential or high-performing pieces of owned content and utilize paid tactics and all of their powerful targeting capabilities to massively extend the reach of your content to carefully crafted segments that match up with your audience personas. Publishing and only organically distributing your content, waiting for it to be discovered or shared, is a surefire way to fail. Placing ad spend behind your content intelligently increases the amount of qualified people seeing it, increases the chance of it being shared, and ultimately increases your chances of increasing revenue and gaining new customers. Oh, and because of how well your content operations team is running, you can easily analyze your data to gauge your return on ad spend. Always make sure paid content is a part of your distribution plan. The following brands represent the best of the best when it comes to buying in and committing to everything content marketing is built around. They have spent years honing their craft and scaling their content marketing to where you're about to see it. I'm choosing the best of the best because they serve as good inspiration for why you should get started. And there's small takeaways here from every brand I'm about to discuss. The American Express Open Forum started as a literal forum for small business owners almost 10 years ago. The idea was to connect these entrepreneurs so they could share advice and stories between one another. That community aspect still exists today, but American Express was able to turn it into much, much more by providing a plethora of helpful content produced by their own team or outside contributors. 75% of the content here is awareness content meant to help anyone who comes to the site. If you're a business professional, small business owner, really anyone with a career, there's probably valuable content here. However, as savvy content marketers, American Express utilizes the last 25% of their content in a different manner. Some of the awareness content or calls to action on the site nurture users to become a registered member of the open forum and join the community. They make it easy with LinkedIn integration or signing up through a valid email address. What this registration gets you is access to member-exclusive content, which is more in-depth, granular pieces. It's free, but you have to provide a little bit of info to get it. After this exclusive content, American Express has hard sell, case study-oriented content meant to make you a card member with what are called card member spotlights. These are real American Express card members that tell stories of how the card helped them. They're banking on the same concept that Bonobos banked on with me, that by helping me first, I'd be much more likely to reciprocate. And American Express's strategy is correct, as this site is the number one source of leads for new card members to this day. GE Reports is General Electric's editorial foundation. Think of it as GE entering the publishing business to share stories about a variety of things, as well as talk about themselves in a compelling manner. General Electric is one of the most diversified brands in the world when it comes to the amount of industries they serve. Because of this, GE has an endless sea of great stories they can tell, and best of all, their products are naturally integrated into them without feeling like it's a hard sell. Notice the simplicity of the email capture here. You don't have to fill out 15 fields to get this content. GE wants you to read it, so you simply have a positive association with the brand, inform, entertain, and educate yourself. Additionally, their editor-in-chief, Tomas Kellner, has a strict no press release policy. If GE needs to tell a story specifically about the organization, critical issues affecting them, they use the GE Voices section of GE Reports. Here, you can engage in a variety of content types, so GE's critical issues are told in an immersive way. There may be no other brand that has embraced the idea of not interrupting but rather creating better than Red Bull. 
The energy drink company declared years ago they were firmly entering the content creation business and are a full-fledged publisher in that regard. This is Red Bull's homepage, and it really represents content marketing at a brand level. You have to actually dig into the menu in the upper right-hand corner to find information on their energy drinks. Red Bull believes their brand is more than a product, so they focus on creating informative, entertaining, and immersive lifestyle content for the audiences they believe fit with their core values. Again, notice the simplicity of the email capture. Red Bull is not trying to get way too much information from you so they can give you wings and sell you energy drinks. If you declare an interest in their content, they'll serve it up warm in your inbox. You don't even have to provide your first name. And if you want a more specific type of content consumption, Red Bull has a TV station, a radio station, and the Red Bulletin, their digital magazine. American Express, General Electric, and Red Bull represent the pinnacle of content marketing. You are not going to be them tomorrow. And if you try and do that, you'll probably fail. But what you can take away from all these brands are simple yet critical items. The simplicity of the email capture shows a belief in giving value away for not a lot in return because it will ultimately be more beneficial in the long run. These brands embracing the idea of not interrupting what people are most likely interested in to sell to them can be done on a scale much smaller than this because it's a mindset. Because you can't achieve this scale or have a huge team ready to do this tomorrow, there's a few small items everyone should do to get started. The research phase we talked about has a lot of different tactics involved, but if you want to get this whole process going, there's three priority items you should plan for. Interview those stakeholders and get the different perspectives that shed light on what needs to be done. Once you're done with that, you'll have a very good idea where content marketing fits and where you're falling short. Second, assess your content. You'll have no way of knowing to what degree you can begin until you take an honest assessment of your existing content, how much you have, how good it is. Once you know that, you can understand what can start to be massaged and what can be distributed. And finally, assess your marketing technology and your data. Understanding your data will undoubtedly tell you about your customers and where you are probably falling short in understanding them. Assessing the technology that supports marketing or content marketing will shine light onto the scale you can achieve once you get started. Ultimately, the most critical action item here is to get started in some way. Maybe it's only creating two pieces of content a month, but consistently doing it and with a plan to distribute. Maybe it's more than that. As Seth Godin said, content marketing is all the marketing that's left. It's time to move your organization toward a better way to market your brand. Thank you.